Uh, good evening. Uh, thank you very much uh, for joining. It's a pleasure to uh, have you all uh, for this uh, program tonight. Uh, this is uh, a program on tech in uh, New York. It's going to be a conversation uh, with uh, uh, current uh, uh, Dean Mary Boyce, soon uh, Provost uh, Dean Mary Boyce, and uh, Jeanette Wing, uh, the director of our uh, Data Science Institute. Uh, my name is Armin Avanassians. Uh, I am a proud Columbia Seas graduate. Uh, I'm a former trustee of Columbia University. I'm a lifelong uh, resident of New York, and uh, of course, I'm a great uh, ambassador. Uh, for this great institution. Uh, now, for, for many of those of you, for many of you who know me, uh, you know that uh, that engineering, sciences, analytics, quant, and data science in particular is uh, a big, a large passion of mine. It's my personal focus and my commercial opportunities. It's the vision uh, that uh, uh, that I see Columbia taking a lead in, uh, not only within the university but really on the world. You know, we very much see engineering as the liberal arts of the 21st century uh, to be uh, proficient in technology, analytics, and computers is uh, a requirement in the same way that uh, communication, English, and writing was historically. And uh, Columbia is really a leading institute uh, in that space. Uh, this, this uh, you know, for this evening's uh, discussion, it's gonna be really a conversation about uh, Columbia's rise and most importantly, uh, how we put our uh, university on the path for being a community leader in technology as it relates to the city of New York. Now, many of you know, but some of you may not know, that New York City is a uh, significant uh, uh, technology uh, hub. It is, uh, in fact, the, uh, the most prominent city in the, uh, in the country outside of California. Uh, it typically, uh, on most measures, would edge out Boston, Austin, many of the other uh, cities that are uh, known to be uh, large in tech. And for those of you who are familiar with tech and tech hubs, great tech hubs are known as being associated with great universities. And Columbia University is the great university in the city of New York that really is helping drive many of these innovations. Uh, so tonight uh, with, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, I'm always, uh, I'm always uh, uh, reluctant to call her the uh, Avanassian's director of the Columbia University Data Science Institute, Jeanette Wing, and Mary Boyce, uh, Dean of the Fu Foundation School of Engineering and Applied Science, and incoming provost, as I mentioned. And also, uh, oh, I have the Morrison A. Shalma professor uh, giving the introductions of people who are talking. I'm sure all of you really know you uh, know her. Uh, I also like to highlight that uh, uh, that uh, Mary is the first uh, woman to hold the post of Dean and uh, Provost. So Mary moving to Provost is a massive statement for uh, Columbia, especially the stance in technology. And Jeanette has been a long outstanding reputation from her days as a Microsoft developers. These are great panelists we have. Plus we're fortunate to have Donna McPhee moderating our discussion tonight. Uh, Donna is a fellow alumnus and president of Columbia University uh, Alumni Association. Uh, she is a uh, closet quant. She's a, a graduate of applied mathematics uh, in 1989, and uh, she's a founder of Columbia's uh, Community Builder. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Donna. Thank you so much, Armin. And we're so excited that you're able to join us tonight. And I certainly am excited to be here with two tech powerhouse women representing Columbia University. We've all read about tech expanding in New York City through Google and Facebook, and there's a groundswell of change happening right now. I'm proud to say that Columbia is certainly leading it with engineering and data science and collaborations across the university. Tonight, we wanna to explore what the future looks like and why Columbia is such an important driver through engineering for humanity and data for good these missions and visions through the Engineering School, Data Science Institute, and certainly the overall university. So it promises to be an exciting and enlightening conversation and don't hesitate to put questions in the Q&A. So let's get started and I'm gonna turn it over to Jeanette first to talk about what's the change that is happening now. So thank you very much for having me and welcome everyone, all the alum and others who are on the line. It's great to speak to you uh, from Columbia's campus. So first of all, I, I wanna echo what Armin said. 
New York City is a tech hub. It's something that perhaps uh, might surprise many of you, but it is, it's actually historically been very strong in technology and it's strong right now and it's growing. Um, it's something to celebrate, something to embrace and push for the future, the future of New York City, the future of technology and the future of Columbia. Um, one of the uh, points I would like to make is that, for instance, in contrast to say Silicon Valley, tech in New York City is pervasive and it permeates throughout. It's in every sector in New York City, every company in every sector. And tech, tech enables and elevates all companies in all sectors. Uh, and in New York City, it's part of our fabric. It taps into our creative and a diverse thinking as represented by all the strengths we have in New York City, including finance and marketing and fashion and pharma and retail. Um, and the second point I'd like to make is that technology and society go hand in hand. And that is very much the Columbia Engineering for Humanity and Data for Good. And it's very much speaks to the kinds of students and faculty Columbia tracks. And it's very much the kinds of talent that the tech companies and non-tech companies need as they move forward in increasing tech for themselves. And that it is, I think, the way of the future. Um, and uh, I'll stop there and let Mary pick up on Talent Pipeline. And we can talk more about other ways in which Columbia, New York City, and tech go hand in hand. All right. So uh, thank you, Jeanette and Donna. Um, maybe before I start, since, uh, since we have an audience of very proud Columbia alumni here, uh, I want to make sure that everyone realizes and knows that uh, this year's Turing Award winner, uh, the Turing Award is the Allen Turing Award, is the most prestigious award in computer science. It's considered the Nobel Prize of computer science. The Turing Award was announced yesterday and it went to Professor Al Hayhoe uh, from our computer science department, the Lawrence Gusman Emeritus Professor of Computer Science for his work on programming languages and compilers, which are the foundation uh, for everything uh, that we do now. The New York Times article uh, quoted one of his uh, former students who's a, who's a leading researcher at Microsoft saying, you wouldn't be able to write an app today without what, without what Al has done. You would not be, the cards would not be what cards are today. So as proud uh, Columbia alums, you should be aware of this. And also that his his collaborator, longtime collaborator, who's the co-winner along with him, is Jeffrey Ullman, who is actually has his bachelor's degree from in electrical engineering from Columbia Engineering. So it was a Columbia Computer Science Fest Day yesterday as we celebrated this amazing achievement. Um, and that sort of further underscores that we have really been building this powerhouse at Columbia uh, across uh, you know, engineering, computer science in many different areas for many, many years. And, um, and it has totally accelerated in the last, uh, I'd say the last 10 years on where are we as, a, as an engineering school in an incredible university such as Columbia. Uh, you know, our commitment to the liberal arts remains strong. Our commitment to all of our professional schools remains strong. But what we are seeing today uh, is how does engineering really intersect with all these other fields and how do we propel it? And so now that brings me to the talent question. I think we have a unique place here as Jeanette was, was commenting on how here in New York City, we have so many different leading industries in the life sciences and media and fashion and finance. And all of these are now being so intersected um, uh, by a, a bold new future uh, driven by advances in computer science, data science, artificial intelligence, computation, but also advanced materials 
and sensors and devices. Um, so, so at Columbia, you know, we are really positioned to attract students who care about these other fields. They care about their impact on society, okay, on our lives every day, on humanity. That's where our engineering for humanity comes from. And we think that this commitment to the liberal arts together with engineering as a foundation really attracts incredible talent and diverse talent, which New York City is also known for. So we're seeing this in our undergraduate student body in our graduate student body coming from across the nation, around the world. Uh, we're particularly proud of our, um, our ability to attract women. Uh, to, maybe Jeanette and I are a little biased about attracting women uh, to technical fields. Um, and we don't know why it's not always been that way, but we know it's not always been that way. And, and uh, we have over 50% women in our incoming uh, uh, in uh, first year class this year, and 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 likely will be going that way uh, next year. Um, we've also at our undergraduate level uh, been able to attract students from historically underrepresented backgrounds, and now we're working on how do we move these uh, this talent up through the pipeline uh, into our graduate student body and our faculty. Uh, so it, it's really is this whole sense of uh, engineering is at a whole different level now, right? Where Where is the impact that we can have? So it's not just, you know, do you love math and physics and, and chemistry? You know, if you were like me, that's what dr drove you here. But also you want to have that impact, positive impact on society, on all of the different fields that really matter to, to human lives across the world. So I think this sense as Jeanette was saying, these, these things are starting to intersect and fuse in a really powerful way. And I think Columbia is a place where it's really happening and we are really boldly moving into that future. I wanted to uh, comment on a couple of points Mary made and I'm really glad she started with the Turing Award <laughs> because I have uh, very fond memories as Mary heard me say yesterday of uh, being an undergraduate uh, co-op student at Bell Labs when Al Aho and Jeff Ullman were working together. Um, and the reason I bring up Bell Labs is, of course, that is a part of the history of tech in New York City or the New York City region. And I remember how kind and generous Al was in inviting us undergraduates over to his house for dinner. And he was this giant in compilers and algorithms and programming languages. and. He continues to inspire generations of computer scientists. Mm -hmm. And I have a personal story on Jeff, too. I, I didn't share this with you, Mary, but um, Jeff Ullman, when he saw me on the Zoom call, when we told him about the news, that actually remembered my father as one yeah. of his professors. My father, <laughs> to the alumni in the audience, was a professor of electrical engineering at Columbia University yes. um, for many, many years. And a very uh, beloved professor, <laughs> I have to say. Very so I, it, Columbia is definitely in my blood. <laughs> um, but I wanted to actually make another mention that Mary um, said about our um, engagement with the humanities and social sciences with a concrete example. I have a student, uh, he was an undergraduate at Columbia, a double major in philosophy and computer science. Now, first of all, there are not many schools where you can do that kind of double major. Um, and he did his undergraduate thesis on fairness in machine learning, but from a philosophy point of view. And then when he started working on a research project with um, some faculty and myself, he wanted to understand fairness in machine learning from a technical point of view. And so it's, it's just a joy working with people like that mm -hmm. who have this broad, these broad perspectives on the very technology that we know uh, is impacting people's lives. Mm -hmm. And especially with respect to properties like fairness yes. um, and social justice. And so again, this is this is such a Columbia story, 
Um, and it is also reflective of the importance of understanding the societal implications of the technology that we invent, especially in data science and machine learning and AI uh, today. Yes. So we've talked about the talent um, and certainly the talent at Columbia as well. Um, some people are surprised to know of the leadership role that New York City has with startups and entrepreneurship. Um, Mary, do you want to start off and then certainly Jeanette chime in talking about what is the entrepreneurship and startups in New York City? What do you see happening and what do you see in the near future? Yeah, so so the great question, Donna. And as as well, hopefully most people know, but maybe they don't. So I'll start off by saying that. Uh, that New York City is is now the the second most top uh, entrepreneurial uh, location in the country. Uh, you know, everybody thinks about Silicon Valley, um, but New York City is actually a hotbed of entrepreneurship. And I I think that that's it's it's from this convergence. Um, uh, so us academics like to use the word convergence a lot. <laughs> so, so let me say what that means first. That when we have these different disciplines converging, new things happen, right? So you know the the convergence of medicine and and uh, engineering, right? We've, we've got an explosion of startups happening there, and of course we see what's going on in finance and. And engineering, and, and we can map that onto so many different fields. So I think that that drives innovation and creative thought. And of course, New York has always been a, um, you know, a, a world of finance, right? A, a capital of the world of finance, probably. So there's also the the um, financial structure and the venture capitalists who are coming in and supporting these companies. So we see many many um, startup companies. Um, and, and, and moving beyond startup ha happening happening in New York. Um, and it's not, it's not just at Columbia, it's across the city, but Columbia's is absolute feeder to, for this, both in terms of the talent that we're producing, the numbers of, of graduates coming out of Columbia who want to stay in New York, who are driving, helping drive the economy of New York, and then the and the ideas and it's across so many so many different areas so let me get i'll, I'll talk about biomedical a little bit and then maybe jeanette might want to talk on, on some of the other areas but in in biomedical um you know we have so much going on across uh, across engineering and applied science and 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 medicine and we we now have actual physical incubators Okay, where once we have new ideas coming out of faculty labs, out of collaborations between engineering and, and medical um, researchers, uh, you have new technologies coming out, uh, organs on chips. Uh, there's all sorts of nice, wonderful <laughs> names. Uh, uh, new your ability to generate your own um, organs from from stem cells. There's a lot of different technologies. Uh, point of care diagnostics. These are all new things coming out of our research labs and also things coming out of the student projects, right? And then we have incubators. Uh, so physical spaces which have the biotech capabilities for the new companies to get off the ground and going. We actually have two, one, two that are very, very closely uh, uh, located to Columbia, one near the Morningside campus called Harlem Biospace, and one that just opened up, uh, Harlem Biospace had so much success. Another one has opened up at the medical campus called Alexandria Launch Labs. So we have this ecosystem that is really helping propel and, and uh, the success of these companies. And we also have just in a more sort of uh, technology uh, centered startup uh, downtown, Columbia overall has a Columbia Startup Labs, a CSL uh, downtown. And so there's many different ways we're able to help propel um, uh, alumni, students, faculty uh, to really um, take their their idea um, out of the lab into the marketplace. We have and a number of uh, of accelerators uh, that our Columbia Technology Venture hosts for us called uh, called Lab to Market 
accelerators across different fields. So there's many ways that we're really promoting this. Many are IP based. Uh, you would be surprised that we had something like 30 companies of, across different types of industries coming out of Columbia Engineering, uh, out of Columbia Engineering IP over the last five years, whereas uh, we also have other ones coming out of student ideas that were not collect, connected to IP. So this is there's a huge ecosystem that Columbia is definitely part of propelling. And in New York City is, is also really supporting and helping drive this through, um, through different initiatives in the city. Uh, we have new industry collaborations. Um, and um, I, I'll let uh, Jeanette talk a bit about IBM because it was even an innovation entrepreneurship element uh, associated with that. Um, you know, I, I know I can go on and on. So I, let me um, let me give the floor or the Zoom, let's call it, to Jeanette for a few minutes. Thanks, Mary. I actually uh, want to pick up on your word ecosystem yes. and, and emphasize that it does, and, Ar and Armin mentioned this as well, the ecosystem includes, of course, the startups. It also includes the big companies and there's big tech companies, of course, increasing their footprints in New York City, Google, Amazon, Facebook, Microsoft, uh, and you name it. Um, and they're hiring more talent and it's not just tech talent. Right. Um, and the other part of the ecosystem is the universities which Armin mentioned already. And of course, Columbia, we like to think is, is the, uh, you know, the biggest and, and baddest of the <laughs> universities uh, feeding that the talent um, that the ecosystem needs. But there's a subtle um, uh, point I wanted to make, which is why I think tech in New York City is just going to continue to grow and grow and grow. And that is, it used to be that, you know, you'd have a few startups and they would go off, they would start up, and then they would go to Silicon Valley. And I always wondered, you know, why, why is that? Why don't they stay in New York City? And I think this is going to change in the future. And the reason is, with more and more startups, with more and more ecosystem people, including non-tech people, so lawyers and HR people and, and, and so on, and what I would call middle managers who, um, who rise up through the ranks in big companies or small companies, that creates a whole swath of talent at all levels of all dimensions and, and not just tech um, that are you know, e easy, easy to move around, look for opportunities. And this is what is uh, very natural in Silicon Valley, a lot of jumping around, if you will, from company to company, from big company to startup, from startup to big company. And I feel like this is, this is already happening in tech in New York City. And with all the kind of ecosystem points that Mary was making, it's just gonna be, it's just gonna happen more. And I think that is something that will keep startups in New York City. It will grow the startups to become the next big thing. Um, it will continue to attract big companies to come to New York City and expand their footprints. Um, and that will mean more demand of our talented graduate students and undergraduate students. And so that's all part of the ecosystem. Uh, and I, I just wanted to, to make mention of that. And, and that the last part of the ecosystem, and this is, this is harking back to my, my time at the National Science Foundation, is also government funding. Um, and we, of course, um, uh, you know, are very successful at Columbia in raising research funding for the, uh, the the basic research we do, and all of that research funding is coming from uh, usually federal funding agencies. And this speaks to the biotech industry, where th the work we do on basic research uh, in the medical campus might spin off into some biotech, uh, and similarly in engineering. Um, but it also uh, speaks to all the science and engineering um, kind of basic research that we do on campus, um, AI, machine learning, you name it. Um, so I, I think the word ecosystem is quite important and it, it's, it's, it's all kind, all small to large, all kinds of uh, sectors, um, all kinds of talent. And let me, let me um, echo some of that. So the, um, 
first starting with the, uh, the research enterprise. So universities have an amazing um, research enterprise. And this is where some of the most fundamental breakthrough ideas come now from, from university research labs. And Columbia has just ha has amazing talent in our faculty and our students pursuing this very basic fundamental research. And it is indeed funded primarily by, by government funding. We also have industry supporting some of this basic research. But we were just having a, um, a, a faculty, um, a, a small group re retreat thinking boldly about our future. And one of the things that we talk about is this whole ecosystem from our basic research to our innovation to actually translating out into the real world and our engagement with industry. But when we were talking about the basic research and on into innovation, one of the words that phrases we were using is that this enables us to also be ready. Be ready. You have the new things are coming up. We are part of that. We are driving that. We are fundamentally using our create creativity to, to really um, have those breakthrough technologies and innovations that are then we map in. And sometimes we're driven first by the challenge and then that creates the 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 new breakthrough. But sometimes we're where we come up with the breakthrough and then that we are ready for to bring that to the challenge. So there's a whole um, cycle to to this uh, connection between research to innovation to, to the market. Right. So and this is a, this is also part of the ecosystem of how do, how do we drive that. And then back to what Jeanette was saying about, um, you know, companies and um, uh, coming into New York, right? So we are seeing, and I, I wanted to bring that point back because of our COVID experience, right? <laughs> In the last year, which has been rather, you know, difficult on, um, you know, let's face it, New York is the center of everything. And New York is the one who kind of figured out how to, that we, we were the battleground of COVID at the beginning and really, um, you know, Columbia in particular up on our medical campus really came uh, to the forefront on COVID, but we also see how it impacted so much of the city. And yet there is incredible optimism. How are we going to bring New York back? And we are seeing industry voting for New York, right? That, that we are seeing that the technology companies have decided to further expand in New York. Okay, they're not leaving New York. Okay, and this this is part of really a, the presence of uh, having the large established companies who also, by the way, frankly, are at at the forefront of a lot of research as well, uh, really engaging, and it enables us to actually be able to support uh, the whole startup of new companies as well, and have that whole university ecosystem together with startups, together with the large companies, together with government. So there is this rather, um, everything feeds on each other. And, uh, and, you know, and it enables us to attack the biggest challenges of our time. I wanted to also pick up on something Mary just said um, that I, I forgot to say, and, and she, she had alluded to. And this is the importance of the university um, and and the relationship universities have with industry. So first, um, as Neri uh, reminded me, we have a Columbia IBM Center on blockchain and data transparency. This is actually a big deal for Columbia um, to have such a deep partnership with, of course, a longstanding collaborator, IBM has been in our history um, from the very beginning of IBM research. Um, and, and so has Bell Labs. Um, but also more, more newer are, for instance, the um, collaboration that engineering has with Amazon on AI. And the reason I bring this up is, um, you know, Amazon knows that if it wants to know what the state of the art in and where the frontiers of a particular field are, they know to come to the university because we are doing the basic research that's pushing the frontiers, that's driving the state of the art. And so if they want to be 
looking ahead five years or 10 years to know what's coming down the pike, they have to be partnering with universities. It, it's it's um, some companies will have their own research lab and, and like an IBM or a Bell Labs or Microsoft research, but other companies will simply partner with the universities and let us, um, you know, uh, drive the frontiers forward. And so that's another way in which the, there's industry university um, partnership works in feeding this innovation ecosystem. Yeah. And so, uh, let me say, it's also not just the tech companies that uh, you can could go across uh, the engagements we have with in the medical field, the engagements we have in the finance field and in the business field and, and, and in media and even collaborations with like fashion institute. <laughs> so, so this, there's a sense of, um, of how we are able to push this whole whole new frontiers. Um, and at a university, you can do that. You can really just be out of the box in, in, in where you take things. So Mary and Jeanette, further to that, we, we started to talk about collaborations and certainly as Armin mentioned earlier that Mary will in July be the first engineer provost and first female program provost of the university. Congratulations. The Dean of Columbia Business School, Christis McGlaris, is an engineer. Um, Lee, as part of his legacy, has talked about the fourth purpose of impact in addition to research, education, and service. And so we have our Data Science Institute, we have engin engineers leading a significant part of our institution. Collaborations are so important. What do you see in, currently and in the future with collaborations, not only with industry, as you've talked about, but across all the schools in, of the university? Yes, yeah, so we see so much happening already. Um, I, do, I do think it's, uh, you know, uh, as um, Armin says, is, is it some sort of statement to have someone with an engineering background, say a science and engineering background um, at a provost position at Columbia? I think it does signal that there, the importance of engineering, of science, of applied science, and how it's really becoming more and more foundational and cuts across so many different fields. And, uh, and, and of course, you know, we, we maintain our commitment to the liberal arts, to, um, to all of our professional schools. Um, but how, how do we really now start to engage even more? So when you look even just over the last several years, the number of, um, uh, you know, whether it's education or research, the number of collaborative uh, programs across schools um, have have just started to explode because it is at the I call it at the interfaces at the interfaces of these different different disciplines that new things happen. So, for example, you know, engineering has joint degrees with with the School of Journalism. We have joint degrees with the the business school. We have also, uh, you know, an MS, MD, an MS and BME plus an MD at the medical school. So we have many, many different, I can go on and on that the number of, of touch points um, for just joint degrees. Uh, the, the, our MS in data science is actually a joint degree between computer science, IEOR, and statistics, right? So, so creating these ways to, um, to really engage across across disciplines um, that we're seeing that even in our education programs. And when we look at research, uh, the, the research programs are highly, highly um, collaborative. And I think they, they, at a place like Columbia, we have almost everything, right? So you can think of that we have faculty who, who work on the very, very fundamentals of of, um, of chip chip design. So silicon, what's called silicon photonics. So how do you put photonics on a silicon chip? And that work, and this is where I say we have the, the be ready part. That work is started to create green 
data centers, right? So how do we how do we move information not through electrons but through photons so that we we're dis not dissipating so much energy when we're doing all our computing? So that's what, why we mean green data centers. <laughs> Sorry, I have to explain everything, but <laughs> but but these same faculty are using that kind of technology now together with with our neuroscientists in the at ZMVBI to, to image the brain, right? To go in and image and and you know excite the brain, neurons. Um, th so there's there's things that we can do collaboratively across fields of how how and it's not just engineering going across fields. There's many different other fields crossing as well, um, but. You know, how do we how do we better enable those engagements? Um, I do believe um, the President Bollinger's initiative, which we're calling the fourth purpose, uh, the fourth purpose of a university, meaning how do we bring our knowledge to real world action, knowledge to action? All this is again coming. We can go back to our whole discussion a few minutes ago of the ecosystem. But you know, in engineering, uh, in business, and in medicine, and in public health, for example, we we all, we sort of that's part of our DNA that we're we're doing our fundamental work, but we have a sense of where this is going to translate into real world impact. But but that's not true across all disciplines. And the fourth purpose is how do we how do we help enable. Um, the, those who, who work in, in all different areas who want to bring their knowledge to impact, how does the fourth purpose help us move that forward? Um, so I think we're going to see a lot at these interfaces uh, and, uh, and how do we enable them? The Data Science Institute is an absolutely stellar ex example of of an institute that started in the School of Engineering, but quickly got the traction across so many different disciplines, bringing them together, and it's it's actually expanded uh, even even more and greatly since Jeanette joined. So maybe Jeanette wants to say a little bit about yes. the different schools involved in the Data Science Institute. So I'm going to stop here. Yeah. And, and um, she can give some examples. There. Yeah, so I first I want to um, pick up on um, Donna's point about collaboration across the university. And uh, the, the simplest story is that everyone has data um, and everyone um, whose data especially is digitized wants data science expertise. So when I first came to Columbia, I thought I would have to go around and cajole everyone about the importance of data science in their future in research and education. But it's been just the opposite. It's been people knocking on my door saying, I have this really interesting data set, but I need your data science expertise to help me understand what value I can get out of this data. What kind of insights can I get? And then what kind of actions can I take once I gain these insights? And so uh, it, the demand for data science expertise across the university has really risen. And it, the Data Science Institute collaborates with all 18 schools and institutes and colleges, including Barnard and Teachers College. Um, but it's just been wonderful, very gratifying to see this interest in data science and the, the fact that people are recognizing that data science is in their future. Um, and the, the, the point about fourth purpose, as Mary so rightly said, is this from, from knowledge to action. Um, and in fact, the Data Science Institute is taking this to heart. So we are hiring um, people in the research scientist track who are, you know, PhDs in data science or machine learning or computer science or statistics. And they know state of the art in data science, but they're interested in working with domain experts to light up their data and thus together then figure out what is the right decision to make um, that could have an impact on society or on the policymaker. Uh, and so this is very much in the spirit of fourth purpose where we're taking um, from, from data to knowledge to action. <laughs> yes. 
Um, well, thank you, Jeanette and Mary. And before we go to Q&A, I'm going to bring Armin back. Um, and I love the fact that you we're talking about all this collaboration, certainly from the Columbia Alumni Association perspective, where we bring the 380,000 living alumni all over the world together from all the schools of the university. So Donna, I, I have, I forgot to say something very important. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> Sorry. One of, the, one of the important collaborations that the Data Science Institute looks for in, in, in at Columbia is to bring in the um, thinking of social scientists, of ethicists, of philosophers into the technology um, mindset. And this is because of the importance of using data responsibly um, and ethically, uh, uh, respecting the privacy of the individuals whose data we collect. Um, and it, you know, this is again, a very, very um, important point that Columbia is the, the perfect place where you can have the technologists talking with the sociologists and the philosophers uh, together on the same, on the same ground, um, technology needing that sensibility as it's being designed before it's even deployed and understanding what are the consequences of deploying this technology and 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 how can we make sure we don't how can we make sure we do good with this technology and and again i, I really want to emphasize that the kind of people at columbia make this possible make these conversations possible and, and that's that's exemplified in, in both the like engineering for humanity and data for good. Right. And I think that at Columbia, it's a place where it really can happen because of the so many um, expertise across every discipline and how do we really bring those together. And back to New York City tech, it is also what tech companies today realize they desperately sorely need. Um, as government is breathing down their neck, as uh, customers and um, uh, you know the public are starting to be are starting to question this very technology that's using that's being used to make decisions about them, um, and they are right to question these these issues. Um, and. Who further to who is <laughs> yes. Armin, who I think has popped up. I think Donna's trying to quiet us down. So. Okay, oh, yeah, Armin, you have to speak now. <laughs> hey, we're, we're gonna, we, we do need to get to some okay. questions have been coming in. I've been monitoring them and I do want to get to some of them, even though I had some questions already prepped. Um, and well, Armin, uh, you know. who, who built Quanta Golden Sachs, an extraordinary university citizen, um, and certainly has kept Columbia front and center in both your personal and professional life. So what are your takeaways from listening today from the tech side, trends you see, and how you are leveraging Columbia throughout your life? Well, of course, you know, uh, in fact, uh, as a uh, homage to, uh, you know, Alfred Aho, oh. uh, my, uh, <laughs> my textbook in algorithms, an algorithms course that I took at Columbia as an electrical engineer focused on signal processing, uh, Columbia allowed me to take a graduate course in computer science. And this book, this course that was taught by a for who, uh, someone who ended up to be a dean of former Dean V. Galil, changed my thinking and approach. Uh, Jeanette has been known to talk about computational thinking, algorithmic thinking. How you approach a problem algorithmically was uh, a cornerstone to how I thought of issues, problems, and solutions when I went out into uh, into my field. Unfortunately, uh, I wasn't at Bell Labs when Alfred was there, but I uh, was at Columbia when I took this course. And to add to that, when I decided to take this course, uh, I actually was originally going to take a course by another uh, great uh, alumni of Columbia, a fellow named David Shaw, D.E. Shaw, who was a professor at Columbia uh, discussing massively parallel computing architectures. He, like I, decided to go into finance. Uh, he was a bit more successful because he founded one of the premier, the premier uh, quantitative hedge funds. 
and after making billions of dollars, decided to come back to Columbia, where he is an associate or a research fellow, a senior research fellow in uh, computational biology, working on uh, protein folding to the point that uh, Mary was talking about, engineering, computer science, biology, all coming together uh, in my one personal life, one my one personal observation. So how is it that Columbia has such uh, multidisciplinary, multi-approaches, just these two people I'm talking about to say nothing of all the others? It's because it is in the city of New York. New York is founded as being a multidisciplinary, multicultural uh, uh, you know, city where the uh, finance uh, uh, bigwig is hanging out with the artist who is hanging out with the artist. It, that is what New York is. And why is New York such a strong tech center? Because that's what tech needs. It is a fantastic startup uh, you know, uh, uh, structure in California, but you know, tech was uh, foresightful enough to say at some point, you really get into groupthink. You, know, you just start talking in your own bubble. Uh, Google and Facebook have put major research centers in New York because they need and they want that diversity of approach that diversity of talent uh, to the point that we discussed. You want that ecosystem that isn't just a monoculture, it's a multi-culture. You have the lawyers, the artists, the philosopher who's joint, vent, joint majoring in computer science to come up with a different lens on philosophy, a different lens in computer science. That's what makes New York a tech hub. That's why New Columbia reflects that. We are in the city of New York, we reflect that entire diversity of approach, diversity of talent, multicultural, multidisciplinary. That's what we are. And uh, how can you summarize what a fantastic uh, conversation uh, we had, which are a whole set of uh, proof points along those uh, along those lines. So, so I'm sure there are a lot more questions to ask I mean, the audience. I, 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 I took my graduate algorithms course with that book too. <laughs> By the way, I, I uh, to this day, I would say I would suggest you all take it. Uh, even in finance, you know, when we're looking for people in finance, the quiz and the tests we give are always algorithmic. And if you're going to go on Hacker Rank or uh, Lead Code or whatever it is, uh, you know, get this book. It'll change how you think. So we got a question. You all talk so positively about New York, and certainly um, I have stayed in New York City as almost half our alumni have stayed in New York City since they graduated or in the tri-state area. But we got a question from Howard Straitman, who's a graduate of the engineering school as well as the business school, who says, what are the biggest constraints to having New York be as big a tech success as Silicon Valley? And any of the three of you chime in. So what? Uh, so I I think we talked about the benefits, right? That and I, I, I let me go back to this because I think Armin really um, exemplified it in terms of the the diversity of thought, and the the diversity of people and cultures and and um, perspectives and how that really um, fosters uh, the the new innovations and 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 the crossing of of fields. So. If you'd say, what is the biggest constraint in New York? You know, we're not going to build a manufacturing plant in New York City, right? That, that is a constraint, right? We're not gonna build the manufacturing plant. But uh, so, that, so of course that, that, that is one constraint. Um, but, you know, we have other ways to, to, to keep moving that forward because all the, the you can get the new uh, technologies off the ground here, and then you'll have to really build them and mass anything physical um, outside. But I, but that, of course, will always be a constraint. But it's not a constraint that's been limiting, because it actually can. You know, if you're if you're an engineer, <laughs> constraints uh, you optimize around your constraints, right? So you 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 address uh, th those things that you can and work around that constraint. Jeanette, do you have a different Well, actually, what I was going to say is we have actually learned from COVID, the COVID-19 era, um, that 
physical space constraints doesn't stop um, our work right. from uh, per, uh, because you learn you you because adapt because of digital adapt. technology we can actually work virtually and still be very productive. And I think what's going to be interesting looking ahead is how does New York City as a tech hub uh, take advantage of the actually the density that we have in New York, where I don't have a car and I'm happy I don't have a car, um, but also the capability that one has with being able to work virtually. And even the university is thinking, in the future, how do we take the, get the best of both worlds? But, so I, but, I, I view, you know, this constraint is absolutely the space constraint is a constraint <laughs> and we probably won't build manufacturing, <laughs> but also digital technology frees us um, in some sense from, from but, I but let me that. let me also say, of course, the digital technology enables us to do things more um, remotely and in, in all sorts of different configurations. but. But the space constraint also leads to other innovations, right? So New York, when we when we look at where where is the population moving to and best accommodated as our population grows, uh, where is it best accommodated uh, in terms of even just the future of our planet, and that is going to be and is already demonstrated to be in urban environments. So New York City. Um, and this is something we are working on at Columbia, New York City itself becomes the test bed, right? That, that our constraint actually becomes a, um, a benefit, right? Because we know what, what it's like to try to house millions of people, <laughs> to actually transport millions of people. How do we move all of these things to whole new ways of doing it? And coming back to what Jeanette said, uh, COVID opened our eyes to a lot of things that we maybe we need to be doing rather differently, right? Do we really need all these cars <laughs> in, in the city, right? Do we, you know, how do, should we be thinking about infrastructure? And infrastructure means many things, right? It's transportation, it's buildings, it's water supply, it's, uh, it's you know, the, the, the internet broadband, et cetera. So, so we, you know, sometimes you turn those constraints into into actually a benefit, and and those are things that we are looking at, and and uh, and it's part of you know as we think about boldly about what can we be doing, and how do we as a university not only how do we benefit our city and our state and humanity, but but how do we also use that to help us understand where do we where should we be putting our attention, right? And, and that can drive real innovation and real fundamental research. So we got a question from Paul Bois, who graduated from the college. What is Columbia's impact on the connection between data and life sciences revolutions in the coming decades? What will that, what will the, that impact be? That, that is, a, a, there's a humongous impact and it's very um, multi, uh, multifaceted, all right? So I will leave, uh, Jeanette can talk about the, the, data, the data elements, but it's everything from, you know, how the new devices um, that we are, are coming up with to actually um, uh, learn more about our own biology, but also to treat disease and medical conditions. And this is new materials. This is understanding biological materials. And, and just look at the new, va the, the new vaccine delivery system is that the, the, uh, the, 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 the delivery packet is a lipid bilayer, right? So th there's so many new innovations on how, how the how engineering comes in to really drive the future of medicine and of health. When we start looking at this, this is also over many um, length scales. So we call multiple length scales from the, you know, from the atomic to the molecular to the cellular to the tissue level and 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 beyond to, and to the organ level. And so when we start looking at that. Uh, and this is where I'm going to give Jeanette a, a good pass over, is that we start seeing uh, the amount of, of data that we now are collecting 
over every length scale, okay, when we're trying understanding uh, the the human body and our and biology and how we function and how we can understand disease and treat disease, that we are we are now we're already in an, an area of massive information, massive from imaging to actually molecular structure, um, to you know the DNA sequencing. The, the technologies that are now delivering all this data, all of this is coming from engineering. And, and then how does this now, um, how do we have the right kinds of, of data science and computer science techniques to actually really um, make, make um, usable information and knowledge uh, to, to take action on? So, and, and Jeanette, I'll let yeah, you- Yeah, I'll, I'll just think, that I'll, I'll try to be brief. Um, so as, as Mary was saying, data in, in terms of um, resolution and, and uh, from space to time is voluminous in the life <laughs> sciences. And it's partly because of advances in our scientific instrumentation that's uh, enabling us to devices and so on that's enabling us to collect um, tons and tons of data, uh, more data than we know what to do with um, and, and really uh, more data than we can even analyze. But this data is going to help us um, do things like uh, some of the most advanced machine learning techniques like reinforcement learning and deep learning. Um, if you read about AlphaFold 2, um, they were using these techniques to actually identify protein structures and uh, an outstanding scientific problem that was solved um, by this heavy computational um, machine. So that's just one example of, of, science, of, of using data to build these models that can solve outstanding scientific problems. Um, but more routinely, we're always, already using data for doing things like image analysis, which are going to help radiologists and pathologists and oncologists to figure out what's going on with um, individuals who have um, disease. Uh, we have... Uh, uh, and, and neuroscience as well. Um, and we're collecting also data about individuals. So we have at Columbia University um, this phenomenal data set called Odyssey, um, which has 600 million unique patient records. These are EHRs, and these are from 25 countries from 80 different clinics around the world. And the phenomenal um, aspect about these EHRs is they're all in the same format which means you can ask a single query across 600 million EHRs and get, a, and, and get an answer back. And with just this a phenomenal data set, we can find out how certain drugs are affecting um, uh, the treatment of a particular patient in, in diabetes or hypertension. Um, and this, this data set was actually used to help the equivalent of the FDA determine um, what policies to suggest and, and not and, and, uh, in terms of treating COVID-19 in Europe um, and, uh, and, and, to, and to actually most recently to say that AstraZeneca is actually a safe vaccine to use. <laughs> and so it, it, it's so that's data at the individual population at the individual at a level EHRs, but helping us, uh, do prediction and uh, analysis at the population level. So data at the, the cellular, molecular level, protein structure level, all the way to image analysis, to data at the individual and population level. It's driving life sciences, it's driving medical sciences, and it, it's, it's just tip of the iceberg of what we can do um, in, in, in data and life sciences. Well, wonderful. We've had so many questions. I wish we could get to all of them. I hope for those that have questions that you'll continue to follow up with us. Um, for those that work with Mary and Jeanette, and certainly Armin is an engaged alum who connects with alums all the time. But as we conclude, um, and because we're over time and we're just so grateful to have had all of you here today, um, one piece of advice or thoughts you have um, that you want to give to those listening, the alumni um, and friends and participants about 
learning more, staying connected, what what they can do um, in any aspect, connecting with Columbia or in their professional lives with fellow alums. Armin, I'll start with you. Uh, you know, the uh, there are multiple ways really to stay, uh, I think, connected and stay with, uh, uh, involved with Columbia. Uh, there are, you know, alum the Alumni Association is obviously the first, you know, uh, and foremost place to start. And there are various numbers of uh, talks, panels. Uh, hopefully we will all be back together, um, whether it's uh, the summer or the uh, fall. Uh, we hope to have live events where you can actually build relationships, you know, in a personal perspective. There are various ways uh, to be involved uh, in terms of your time. Uh, giving mentoring to students, uh, uh, having uh, an, if you're in the uh, if you're in industry, being able to um, not just mentor students, bringing in Columbia students for internships and other such events. I'll tell you, you know, when you give, uh, you receive back tenfold. Uh, there's also you know enormous uh, opportunities to uh, be engaged on various different uh, advisory committees and boards, and it really is a function of your level of desire and commitment to give. But I'll say one thing, in all of my philanthropy and all the time that I've given, uh, giving uh, without an expectation of return, I've always gotten tenfold back. Uh, and uh, uh, you know, and I'll, I'll leave it to you, Donna, to really give the catalog of all the ways to be involved. Perfect, well, you said it, and one of the things I've always felt in my volunteerism as Columbia, it's true, you, you give back and of your time and your philanthropy, but Boy, you really do get so much out of it and very so energized and excited. Um, Jeanette, I'll turn to you and then to Mary. So I wanted to say two things. First of all, um, a, a plug for Data Science Day, which is April 21st. We have Pat Jer Bajar Bajare, the chief economist at Amazon, is our keynote speaker. Data Science Day is the biggest event annually that we hold. Um, hundreds of people come. Actually, when we hold it on campus, hundreds of people come. So my guess is that we'll have over a thousand registrants. It's a great way to find out what's going on in data science at Columbia. Our faculty speak, our, we have students speaking and giving posters and so on. So that's one event to keep put on your calendar. But the one request I would ask of all of you is, be, a, a, be an ambassador for us. Spread the word about how great Columbia is, especially um, its role in tech in New York City. Yes. And Mary. Yes, well, I, I'll just uh, probably end up repeating a little bit of what Armin and what Jeanette said is, uh, one, you know, there's many, many uh, of our seminars and, and, um, and events are open to all of our alumni. Uh, Jeanette talked about the Data Science Day, but uh, many, many seminars. So go to the website, you'll see lots of different seminars there. Even in, during our world of Zoom, many are, are just are open and you can be really connected with all that's going on in our research symposia and, and really be understanding more what's going on at our, at, our, at, our, at our School of Engineering. And this is actually true across across many of the different schools at, at, across Columbia. Uh, being engaged with our students, uh, Armin mentioned, uh, you, you know, if, if you're in a position to be a, a mentor or, a, or host an internship, our students really value um, having those real world experiences. We also have opportunities for, uh, for if, you're, if you're at a company that can also sort of sponsor a project. We do a lot of project-based learning across many of the different parts of, uh, of uh, engineering degree programs. Uh, that's another wonderful way to be engaged with students and with and with Columbia. And as um, as we we do say, you know, you are our ambassadors, right? <laughs> that uh, you, you're seeing so much of uh, what Columbia, who is Columbia today and where are we going? Um, President Bollinger has really uh, just uh, given us a, a, a bold path forward. Uh, really, uh, he has been a transformative president 
And where, where are we taking Columbia? Who are we today and where are we going? And it is really um, limitless in, in so many ways. When we think of, of uh, opening up our Manhattanville campus, it gives us an expansive future. And you can see how we're able to capitalize on that expansive future by the the greatness of all the different schools or interdisciplinary institutes and how we how how are we all all as you know loyal Colombians uh, working to to drive that future and I, I do want to say one more element of that future because we didn't comment on it and that that is our commitment also uh, to to our our how will we as Colombia as a place where each school has done so much in the area of, of really um, thinking about energy, water, our environment, um, that Columbia took a bold step to introduce a climate school as part of our future. And it's really to capitalize on the incredible depth and excellence we have across the university. So we all know about our fantastic Earth Institute, Lamont Doherty, but you, you've just heard so much about what's going on in the Data Science Institute, what's going on in the engineering school. And, and we didn't even talk so much about how those impact on, on, our, on sustainability, on, on our environment, on our, on our future as, our, as humans on this wonderful planet that we hope. So, so this is another bold commitment. So how, how are you as Colombians ambassadors to really promote the, the absolute uh, incredible um, research and education programs and are, and are translating that to real world impact? Uh, you are the best ambassadors out there for Colombia. So thank you. And thank you, just tuning in today um, really uh, s s shows your commitment to us. So thank you. Um, thank you, Armin and Jeanette and Mary. And certainly it's true for everyone listening, no matter what you're passionate about, personally, professionally, um, your areas where you want to make impact in the world, it is happening at Columbia University. And you've heard so much tonight and there is so much more. Thank you um, everyone for joining us. Next week's Columbia at Home is Prospects for U.S.-China Relations in the Biden Era, featuring a panel of esteemed Columbia professors from the Weatherhead East Asian Institute. That will take place at a special time to make it easy for our alumni in Asia who are, will join us. It will be Thursday, April 7th at 8 a.m. So before the workday starts in New York, you can register at alumni.columbia.edu. And once again, thank you to our panelists and thank you to everyone for joining. Um, we hope to see you again soon. Take care. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.